Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the March edition of our monthly community engagement spotlight series. My name is Jessica Desardin. I am a program coordinator in the Office of Community Engagement at MCW. Please note that this session is being recorded and please be sure you are muted throughout the presentation. I'd like to begin with a statement from the Office of Community Engagement. We wish to acknowledge the indigenous people who are past and present stewards of the land on which we pursue our just cause of a healthy community for everyone. We encourage everyone to use the chat bar to share comments or post questions for our guests at any time. This monthly series features community partners and the important work they are doing. We highlight their goals, motivation, and accomplishments and the ways they have partnered with people and programs at MCW. Today, we are honored to have Hashem Sabak from Hyatt Pharmacy joining us as our featured guest and Karen Mackinon serving as our facilitator. At this time, I would like to introduce our Senior Associate Dean for Community Engagement, Dr. Stacey Young, who will say a few words about Hyatt's important work for the community. Dr. Young. Great, thanks so much, Jessica. I'm pleased to introduce uh, everyone today to Hashim uh, Zaybach. Uh, Dr. Zaybach is the founder of Hyatt Pharmacy. He started his career as a pharmacist in 1999 and currently runs 20 pharmacies in Wisconsin. Hashim is well known as a medical counselor and dedicates his time to giving health education presentations and teaching patients proper medication administration. Thank you, Dr. Zaybak, for being our featured spotlight guest today. I would now like to introduce today's facilitator, Karen McKinnon. Karen is an assistant professor and the director of outreach for the Medical College of Wisconsin School of Pharmacy. Through her role, she develops corporate partnerships that support the creation of new pharmacy practice models. We are so pleased to have Professor McKinnon with us today. Karen, thank you for serving as our spotlight facilitator, and I now turn the session over to you. Well, thank you for that introduction. And I have to say, this is a privilege, this is an honor, and I feel like I'm introducing the sun. So here comes the sun, Hashem. Yes, you are thank some you. of our, our, our light sometimes, especially during the pandemic for many of us within the Milwaukee area. So thank you so much. Thank um, you for having me. Oh, it's, it's my pri pri um, privilege. So you really have demonstrated pharmacist role, pharmacist impact on patient care, especially during the pandemic where you were combating um, the COVID-19 virus through testing and treating and vaccinating people 24 seven, just to make that community impact that you've had. Um, and for that, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are in a better place because of you. My and pleasure, so thank you. Thank you so, so much. Yeah, I really would love to learn more about you as far as where did you develop this passion for community efficacy and pharmacy? Uh, my, my father himself, um, he wanted to become a pharmacist at some point. Uh, because of his circumstances as a refugee, he couldn't, but he always had the dream of having a pharmacist in the house. So, um, when after I graduated from high school, he told me there's an opportunity to go to Chicago and uh, we have cousins in Chicago. Would you like to go to pharmacy school in Chicago? When I came to uh, Chicago, I went to a community college and initially I was told that in order for, go, for you to go to pharmacy school, you have to be a US citizen. And I'm like, oh no, I couldn't do that. And then I had a counselor, her name was Sandy. She actually called the University of Wisconsin, uh, actually University of um, Illinois, and mm -hmm. she asked them if, if that's true, and they told her that was not true. So I, uh, I was able to apply to the University of Illinois at Chicago, and I got in in 1995, graduated in 1999. And since then, when I worked for um, CVS, the, ch the chain CVS, I, they used to send me to some of the most challenging uh, stores in Milwaukee. Uh, there are certain stores where 
even like some of the floaters would say, no, I don't want to go to this zip code or that zip code. I was the one who's like, no, send me anywhere. I'll go. I'll go to any uh, store you want me to. And I worked at Titonia and Villard. I worked on Capital. I worked in uh, and, and Villard. And it's it's definitely it was an eye opener because when I when I worked in a, some of the more affluent because I was a floater. When I worked in some of the affluent stores, I felt that people had access to a lot more than some of the uh, more challenging areas of Milwaukee. And I felt like we need to do something. We absolutely need to improve that. We need to have more equality. Um, and that's where the idea of Hyatt came. We wanted to offer something where I had control. I had I have control of what to do, what to offer. Um, in, in the big chains, there was always the question, What's the return on investment and what's the liability for the company? For example, if we wanted to do vaccination at home, there was a question of liability. Uh, but since uh, since Hyatt started, we were like, we're not concerned about this liability. We'll take we'll we'll take the risk. And I remember uh, giving the first vaccine at home and I and the first uh, MTM comprehensive medication review at home. Um, and it I felt like by doing that we can make a, a bigger impact and and serve the underserved. Oh, absolutely. Um, you brought up a couple of points that um, just demonstrates your passion to help those that might not know um, what options they might have. Um, I have um, been told that within Hyatt, you have somewhat of a motto, um, and I'm just going to rephrase this because I'm not quite sure if it's quote unquote, but don't let problems or obstacles affect patient care. Absolutely. It's always look for a solution. Always look for a solution. And don't, let, don't assume that just because there's that obstacle that we're going to stop. Um, whether it is the um, shortage of the, of the vaccine, whether it was um, the, the, at some point at the beginning of the pandemic, we, nobody was testing and so we were searching, we were calling CMS, finding solutions, and we were the first pharmacy in Milwaukee to offer the PCR testing. So don't don't let that any any obstacle don't don't let it stop you. And if it's uh, and, bec and because we are small and uh, definitely smaller than the big companies, um, we are able to move faster and we're able to make decisions uh, faster. I tell people. Uh, when it comes to certain decisions, I can, I'm the HR specialist, the legal specialist, the HIPAA uh, specialist, and I can make decisions on the spot if, if I have to. And during the pandemic, we really had to make a lot of decisions almost on the spot, whether to keep the pharmacy open or closed, whether to, keep, to uh, just uh, switch to delivery only. Uh, all of these decisions, we had to move really fast. So uh, it was easier for us as a smaller company to move and, and create programs to take care of the community. When I was um, thinking about Hyatt and your personal outreach in so many of the underserved areas, I, I also focused on the level of trust they have with you and how you build that trust over time. And one of the main things that you are, you're present, you're present um, at their churches, you're present at their um, uh, religious um, affiliated events or whatnot, and you listen. And I really feel as if you've been able to have a great outreach in that regard. What are other ways that you have felt as if you built you have built trust within your community? Going to the places where people go, and they need the extra services, whether it's a church, the senior center, um, maybe even some of the uh, group homes or um, maybe a senior building. And, and being there as a resource and telling them, maybe, maybe I can't help you today. Maybe you don't need any of my services today, but this is my number. You call me and I'll be there. Um, there were a lot of situations where we approached like some churches and they said, no, we're good now. But we, And then a couple of months later, they'll say, we have a health fair. Can you come and speak about diabetes in our health fair? Or can you come and speak about high blood pressure or cholesterol or asthma? Uh, and we're always happy to do that. We're always uh, happy to be there. Uh, and again, when it comes to the return on investment, 
we didn't look at it as, oh, with every event, I have to get 10 patients to transfer to me to make this worthwhile. No, we did it. We offered it, even if there was no immediate return on investment. But we created that emotional connection with the um, with the administration at the church, at the senior center, at the senior building. And people came to us and, and knew that there, when there is a problem, when there is a patient that they know who's having uh, issues with their uh, um, adherence to the medication, they'll come to us and then we'll, we'll help them. That's wonderful. And you also um, have the ability to communicate with many different languages. I'll let you provide the number of languages you and your faculty, your staff um, speak. We, we speak a total of 22 languages. Uh, we, when we interview people, if they say that I speak that, that language as a second language, we immediately uh, try to hire them because anytime you have somebody, like we have somebody who speaks Italian. When you have somebody who speaks Italian, that opens a door for you to a community that sometimes it's hard to um, work with because of the language barrier. The Rohingya, the, there's a lot of Rohingya refugees here in Milwaukee. So when we have somebody who speaks Rohingya, that's a, a huge plus. And then they, you can impact them better. Uh, you can understand their culture better. Uh, you can even know what kind of food they eat. And that also helps in taking care of the patient. So uh, uh, we have we have people who speak a lot of different languages. And then when when somebody when somebody even is at a store, if somebody comes to a store and they um, they speak only Arabic, for example, they'll call somebody else at another store who who speaks Arabic, and then they'll put them on three way in order to take care of that patient. And uh, it's it's very rewarding when you can take care of somebody who normally would not have been taken care of if they went to some other pharmacies because of the uh, language barrier. Right, and, and being able to support such a diverse um, workforce that really commits to your community engagement, involvement, and, and excellent patient care. I, lo I truly love it. I mean, I, I speak Arabic uh, too as, a, as my first language. So anytime there's an event like I'm working with the city of Greenfield uh, next week. They have a an event with a target to focus on the Arabic community. So they they called me and I'm like, sure, I'll be there. And it's fun. It's actually makes you feel like this is why we went to school to take care of the patients and 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 take care, and serving the underserved, finding those patients who normally would not have been taken care of, and you take care of them. Um, I see. I. I... Uh, a chat uh, question has come in, and I'll go ahead and get that later, um, just letting Alexandra know that I did um, catch that you have a question in chat. Um, but you did allude to some changes with the scope of pharmacy since you graduated. Uh, so yes. what are the big changes within pharmacy that you have seen and lived through? I was looking through some uh, a memory box last week of all things that I collected over the years, and I saw an ad that I I was featured in um, in the journal Sentinel for for Jewel Osco, and it said we offer flu vaccine for the first time for people who are they have to be fifty or older. That they, these were the guidelines back then. You had to be fifty or older in order to get the flu vaccine. And I remember I was one of the first few people who uh, got trained. We actually had to get trained on the vaccination after pharmacy school because it wasn't part of our curriculum in pharmacy school. So that was a big change. And uh, now, as you all know, we can we can vaccinate almost any vaccine in, in the pharmacy. And um, um, later on, I, I mean, a lot of the changes came obviously with the pandemic. Uh, the point of care testing, it was, Available, some pharmacists offer it, but it wasn't at a large scale. Uh, and, and, and the pharmacists were kind of nervous. Anytime you tell the pharmacist, oh, let's start this new program. We want to start doing uh, flu testing. Uh, they, they'll, they'll immediately get nervous. And then, and then you have to uh, work with them and tell them it's, it's possible, we can do it. Uh, but I, these are all new things. The, um, 
when when it the PCR testing, offering the PCR testing, we actually had our own PCR testing in the pharmacy, and we were open for for um, 24 hours a day at some point to take care of the patients. That's something that was new. We didn't we didn't offer any PCR testing before. Um, we recently uh, purchased a, um, a a medical clinic. And with this new collaboration, we feel that there's a lot more to do. I think by having the MD, the nurse practitioner, and the pharmacist work under one umbrella, I think we can do a lot more to, for example, control the A1C, cholesterol, blood pressure. Um, and again, when I when I graduated from pharmacy school, that was not that wasn't the norm. Um, but now now it's becoming the norm, and and having the pharmacist offer all these uh, additional uh, uh, vaccines and, I'm sorry, additional services. Uh, I mean, right now, in, in Wisconsin, we have a standing order for birth control pills. So if a lady who's, who doesn't have a doctor uh, or a primary care doctor wants to come to the pharmacy and get her uh, birth control pill, we can do that without having to get a prescription. Uh, these were all unique things. It, during the pandemic, we were able to... Uh, dispense Paxlovid with a standing order. That was also unique. We, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't the norm, uh, but now, now it's, it's very normal and we can, we can do, in Wisconsin, we're lucky because we can uh, 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 do a lot of collaborative, collaborative practice agreements with the physicians and that opens a lot of doors for us. And I think that uh, we're probably one of the luckier, luckiest states when it comes to collaborative practice agreements. I do agree. It gives us a lot of um, ability to um, absolutely a quicker impact for our patients. Absolutely. And you know, you brought up um, interprofessional um, collaboration, and within the School of Pharmacy, we do a lot of interprofessional education as well. And I think that really helps train our students to to know the value of everyone's expertise, everyone's absolutely. area of focus for our patients' care. And when yeah. we when we get a student from Medical College of Wisconsin versus other colleges, you could tell that collaboration is part of your culture at Medical College of Wisconsin, and it really makes a difference for the student and also for their future. Mm -hmm. um, describe some of the activities that you've done with some of the School of Pharmacy um, students that you've had at your sites. We, a lot of pharmacy students, uh, whether it's their, uh, during their epi or api, they, they, they choose Hyatt Pharmacy because they know that if they come to us, they'll, they'll have a different experience. Uh, whether it's the comprehensive medication review, whether it is the um, uh, ability to vaccinate, the ability to test, uh, test, test to treat. I mean, those are all things that uh, are available right now at our pharmacies. And then, and then if they're interested in LTC, we have a uh, long-term care pharmacy where uh, they can check how we do it, what the, what's the technology that's available and how we can uh, make it very uh, efficient. So uh, we usually have multiple students from multiple colleges and pharmacies um, throughout the state uh, all year long. And it's, it's fun. It's actually an, another rewarding experience. You feel like you're paying it forward in order to take care of those uh, students. Right. And and just for those in the audience, an IPI is an introductory pharmacy practice experience, which is early in the student's um, pharmacy education. And then an API is an advanced um, clinical experience. So anyway, it depends on the year that they're in school. But our students are on rotations um, early on and throughout their own curriculum. But being able to apply things that they've been taught within... Absolutely. The lecture and within their labs um, in settings like yours really click with students and allows them to um, put that knowledge back into that memory blo um, block that's not necessarily too difficult to retrieve. Absolutely. And and I mean, I even, we get sometimes uh, uh, pharmacists from other states who want to come and join us be, because they wanted to do something different, not the typical community pharmacy. Uh, so we, we, um, we're getting somebody from Florida in a couple of months. So it's, 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 again, it's fun, it's rewarding, and we feel like we're paying it forward when we have those students. 
Oh, absolutely. They kind of just give you a little bit more of an energy, a little flavor, a little fire of, of just being able to be involved and how many more patients can we actually be helping out? Yeah, absolutely. And, and also it's, it's an opportunity for us to showcase our practice to the students and, and maybe one of them would like to join us in the future. Once they graduate, we've, uh, We've had few students who've uh, come and, and liked the setting and they were like, I can do a lot more here than a typical uh, pharmacy. So so they, they like it. And it's, uh, I mean, the, the old uh, farm, the old setting of just pharmacists filling prescriptions and just filling prescriptions, that, that, that's gone. Now the pharmacist is, in, is involved in a lot more services than he or she uh, did before. Which kind of leads me into that earlier question that Alexandria had asked is um, getting more information about the home-based uh, vaccination opportunities for your patients um, and what vaccines um, do you offer? Uh, we, and honestly, whatever, whatever the patient needs. So if the patient uh, needs COVID test vaccines or uh, or flu vaccine, RSV now is available, RSV vaccine, all of these are available. Um, and we have, when, when a patient comes to us, we can actually check their WIR, uh, Wisconsin Immunization Registry, and find out what they're missing. And then we recommend those vaccines to them. And if, if the patient, again, if the patient is homebound, We'll send a pharmacist. And now we even hired a nurse. We have a registered nurse who works with us and she can also administer those vaccines at home. So um, again, we're looking for uh, these things where pharmacists in the past did not hire nurses. But now with all these additional services that we have, we have pharmacists who are offering it to students and uh, nurses. Awesome. Um, and. I really believe that you've been um, a great collaborator, a collaborator as well as an effective partner within the community. Um, how did you learn about these opportunities, or did they um, come knocking at your door? <laughs> uh, both. You you have to do a lot of networking, and networking is really hard for an introvert like myself. I, I'm I'm naturally my, my I'm an introvert. I really don't like to socialize and have and go to dinners and uh, receptions and uh, but I had to get out of my bubble in order to um, get to to meet all these people and the community leaders and people who can make an impact and make decisions and offer us opportunities to talk to the patients so it's um, it, it and sometimes the opportunity will just come to you sometimes you you just have to be ready. Uh, and people will call us, like sometimes uh, employers will call us and ask us, can you come on site and, and do on-site vaccination? Or can you come on site and do presentations about health topics? Can you come on site and, and do testing? Um, and, and right now, recently we just purchased an A1C and a cholesterol uh, testing machine. So we're, we're even get, we can test uh, patients or, or do some uh, screening for cholesterol and A1 and, and diabetes in the community. Um, it's, was it cheap? Absolutely not. It was, these were very expensive machines. And I, um, if, if we looked at it uh, strictly from the return on investment, hey, how much money are we gonna make from this? We probably would not have purchased it because it, it, the pay is not that well on, on those uh, tests, but it's something that we felt that can help the community it can offer the community a service for somebody who's on the run and they cannot uh, get to see their uh, doctor or go to the lab. This offers them a definitely quick uh, way to test themselves. Uh, and also uh, want to promote your opportunities for um, being able to host a vaccine clinic. I know you just kind of put one out there in LinkedIn saying, hey, you need to host a vaccine clinic. Do you have COVID vaccine? COVID um, vaccine, um, you know, Flu our, vaccine. let us know, is it your workplace? Is it the community or organization? Um, is it a special event? Let us know. We can be there. And you have, again, you have to be ready. You can't just make that post unless you have the staff who are trained and ready to go and who are passionate. Because sometimes 
the person can be trained in a certain area, but they're not passionate about it. Uh, but I know, for example, uh, uh, Mara, she is very passionate about this. And if I, if I tell her there's, a, there's an opportunity to have a clinic at this site, she'll immediately jump on it and she'll be like, I'll be there. So you have to have people who really want to do the right things. Um, speaking on um, the vaccines, um, a clarification as far as what types of vaccines, do you see adolescents being um, a target audience, um, especially for like HPV, or is it more focused on the adults with flu and COVID? We, we definitely, I think as a state, we have an opportunity to do more education uh, to the adolescents because there's definitely a vaccine hesitancy, and there's a uh, the feeling that oh, this is this is not for me. I'm I'm young. I'm healthy. Um, so I think that we need to offer more educational programs. Now, sometimes the they are required to have certain vaccines either for a college or university, whether it's meningitis vaccine or or hepatitis B vaccines, and and of course if they're required, they come and get it at the pharmacy. But uh, if it's not required, sometimes there's a hesitancy when it comes to vaccinating the adolescents. I, th I think I think we we just need to um, r right now it hasn't been really a target for us as a state, uh, but I think it should be. It should be there. There there are a lot of opportunities uh, in that group, especially with vaccination hesitancy. Absolutely, um, it really has come on strong since the pandemic. That's for sure. I mean, even if you look at the flu vaccine and the COVID vaccine, um, if you look at the the people in the adolescent group, many of them are not getting vaccinated because they think, oh, this is only for my grandpa and my grandma. Mm -hmm. We have another question is, how do you envision that now Wisconsin Medicaid has recognized pharmacists as providers? that can bill for their clinical services, just like physicians and APPs beyond immunizations and prescriptions. How will this impact our underserved communities? I think we're gonna be, pharmacists are, are easier to move. We can, we can uh, get into certain communities very easy. We are uh, the most accessible healthcare uh, in, in the whole uh, state. Uh, so I think that this is gonna offer, the, especially especially in some of the most underserved areas or some of the rural areas. I think pharmacists are going to be able to take care of that group of patients and offer them services that right now we are not getting reimbursed for. Mm -hmm. So we're looking forward to this. It's, uh, it's happening July 1st, and I think that's the, that's the date we're going to go live. Um, there's there's, we, we need to also make sure we educate the pharmacist about what they can do and what they cannot do. Um, we need to utilize and have the pharmacist practice at the top of their license. If, if this is something that they can do, why not? It's, uh, um, I think that it's, it's a new change for us as pharmacists that we, I, I'm, I'm very excited about. And um, there's a lot of educational components that are more ingrained in pharmacy school education now than when I graduated 35 years exactly. ago. Exactly. So being able to recognize that, especially with having MCW School of Pharmacy around, being able to use them as a resource for continuing education, for additional Absolutely. shops and whatnot. In fact, we have one focusing on um you know, physical assessment techniques and things like that. Just knowing that um, self-reflection of what your own ability is, as well as where you want to concentrate um, your community involvement and how you can literally um, help others within that area and perfecting uh, your own technique along the way. I was one of the first students to take that physical, physical assessment at Medical College of Wisconsin. I was one of the students myself. And um, definitely very educational and highly recommended. Um, and then another thing, I, I hope that in the future, if, if we do really well with Wisconsin Medicaid, but, and we see that we are making an impact, and I'm sure we will, then that opens the door for other payers. Will private payers are, uh, pay for these services? Will uh, Medicare pay for these services? Because right now, we're gonna be restricted to only Medicaid and hopefully, Hopefully that that this is going to open other doors for us and uh, 
pharmacists in the year 2020, 2030 or 2040 are going to be able to do a lot more than what we're doing today. Oh, absolutely. Um, one thing that I also wanted to bring up is, you know, besides the pharmacist perspective of your background, you really have um, the ability to take a holistic approach to a patient's well-being where um, you've incorporated the MedSafe into your, your stores, um, harm reduction, vending machines, diaper drives. I mean, being able to know what those stressors are for your patients to make sure that you have the time, the ability, and the desire to improve their own health um, is very important to note as well. And you have to know the resources because you can't do any of this alone. You have to be able to partner with organizations and, and find the people who can help you with, uh, whether it's a diaper diaper drive, uh, especially with Giannis being there, that was a big, big event, um, or the Narcan uh, 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 vending machine. Uh, Narcans are very expensive for somebody who d does not have insurance. Um, but now we partnered with the city of Greenfield and, and we're offering it for free, even without a prescription. So, um, and med safes for people who are concerned about others having access to their medication. So, um, look, look for resources and find, find partners. And even in the future, we might be able to, uh, offer other services that we're not even offering today. We have another question in the chat that I'll go ahead and ask. Uh, they start out by, thank you for sharing your insights. Um, you truly have a pulse on your on the community. Looking ahead, what do you believe should be the priorities for advancing pharmacy services, particularly with regard to um, equity? Additionally, how do you foresee Hyatt contributing to these efforts moving forward? And uh, I see pharmacists being able to do more uh, services that are probably even sim similar to what the physician assistants and nurse practitioners can offer now. Uh, I see pharmacists in the future being able to prescribe more. Now we have very limited uh, prescriptive uh, authorities, but I think that the pharmacists in the future are going to be able to prescribe and, um, and do more tests on site uh, with the technology that, that's improving. I think we're going to be able to do some quick tests where uh, we're going to be able to um, get the patient. We know that they uh, they have flu or they have high cholesterol or um, or their A1C is is not controlled. I see us in the future being able to adjust the doses for people uh, on, with diabetes without having to go back to the primary care physician. Um, Right now, for example, with the uh, weight loss, we have uh, physicians who give us standing orders for their patients to adjust their um, weight loss G G GLP-1s uh, from the beginning dose to the second dose, third dose, fourth dose, depending on their side effects and the results they're getting from the GLP-1s. Uh, so a lot of, there are a lot of opportunities out there. Um, and then, Pharmacists right now are involved in, in with a lot of clinics in the chronic care management for people with, with Medicare, in the annual wellness visits for patient, patients with Medicare. So I, I do see uh, a lot of opportunities out there. Uh, and for Hyatt, the second part of the question about Hyatt, we, we are already doing some of this and uh, we're, not, we're not scared of uh, trying something new. Uh, it it can it, it can make you a little bit nervous, but uh, we we have we go into new things with the mentality. And if we fail, what's and so what? We we've at least we've tried. So we uh, we just not scared of trying something new. I always say we pilot something and we we learn from the things yeah. that don't necessarily go well the first time, but think differently. How can we approach uh, it differently? I actually, um, I speak for the National Community Pharmacist Association, and uh, there's a, a PowerPoint that I have that speaks about uh, our history here in Wisconsin. And my first slide in that PowerPoint is about my failures, all the things that I've failed at in my, in my professional life. Uh, and I tell people, it is okay. You, it's okay if, if 
if you fail and and actually you're gonna fail it's it's part of uh, getting to the success. It's uh, one of the steps is to get you to where you want to be. Isn't that so true? Many times we learn more from our failures than from our successes, you know. But we pharmacists, we are perfectionists. We we don't like to fail. We don't like to uh, make mistakes. Uh, because, I mean, who, who goes into pharmacy school? Usually the, the people who, who have good GPAs, the people who are who can who can do math really well and chemistry and biology, and and that's why we we tend to be more of um, perfectionists and and sometimes we we're scared of of uh, of trying something new and I'm telling the people all the people listening uh, today try it try something new um, as long as it's within your scope of practice uh, ask questions uh, ask the Pharmacy Society of Wisconsin. Um, they are they're really a good resource, and uh, look look for where you can make impact as a pharmacist. Even even though initially it may not have the 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 return on investment that you're hoping for, but try it and see something. Um, uh, it, maybe maybe you'll open a new door that was closed in the past. Right. We have another question in the chat says, as pharmacists are doing more clinical services involving patient confidential information and conversations, I would see the need for pharmacies to have more, have uh, pharmacies to create more confidential conversation physical space with patients and pharmacists, rather than the existing setup where everyone in line um, or in the waiting room can hear what is being discussed with the patient. Not all pharmacies have such space, or set up at this time. What um, what do you think, Hashem? Um, for anybody building a new pharmacy, uh, I think it's a must now to have that uh, private room. Whether whether you call it the MTM room or the vaccination room, you absolutely have to have that privacy. So if you, if you're counseling somebody about their for example, their HIV medication. You don't want everybody in the whole pharmacy to know what you're um, uh, counseling them on. So having that confidential room is a must uh, today in 2024 uh, versus, I want to say, I don't know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it wasn't as important, but today it's definitely a must. And you have to, with, with the comprehensive medication reviews, with the vaccines, with the uh, counseling. Um, sometimes patients want to uh, be taken care of privately. So so that's that's definitely a must. Yeah, I agree. I remember um, vaccinating people in the back room. I mean, um, or in a closet, you know, you're right. We've done it. <laughs> We've done, yeah. But, We've um, done it all. Had, you had to work with what you had. Yes. <laughs> Or having um, that uh, white barrier or something, yeah, it's it, they were not ideal. None of the none of the above was ideal. Once the thing, uh, once again, we learn from the past and, and improve upon it. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, I want to reflect about your home visits because as we think about a patient um, that might be non-compliant, might not necessarily be in a very supportive environment, what have you learned when your pharmacists and your technicians have gone to homes and what opportunities to improve their care have you learned? Uh, a lot of times people tell you I'm, I'm compliant with my Advair and uh, I use it uh, twice a day. And then you go visit them and then they have five or six of them stacked on top of each other. And you know that they're not adherent. A lot of times with insulin, they tell you that they're taking their Lantus on a daily basis, but then you go and you find out that they really are not. Um, you find them storing medications not appropriately, something that needs to be refrigerated. They keep that room temperature. You find issues with um, um, even the environment that they live in. If it's if it's an environment that can cause asthma itself because of um, some of the triggers that they have in in their uh, in their home, um, you'll see that yes, in the in the typical in the pharmacy they um, they will fe you will feel like oh this this patient definitely understands what I told them and definitely will follow my directions 
and they're going to be 100% adherent. Uh, but when you go to their home, you'll find out why they're not adherent, why, um, what you can do to improve their adherence and to improve their, their outcomes. You, they're, they're more, they let their guards down in, at home and they, they actually tell you, they're more willing to tell you about some of the things that are making them uh, not able to, um, to, to take their medicine the way they're supposed to or, or follow the diet they're supposed to or exercise uh, like they're supposed to. Um, and especially, especially if you combine that with somebody who can speak their language. If, somebody, if, if somebody's first language is Spanish, and you send somebody to their home who can speak Spanish, you, you, want, you already want them for life. That, that patient is yours for life and they will um, stick with you for a long time. Uh, and then you, you're gonna be able to impact their lives. And, and a lot of the people uh, that we visit, they are in some of the most underserved areas in, in Milwaukee. They, they don't have cars, they're homebounds. So they really appreciate it when you offer that home visit. Do we, do we offer it to everybody? Honestly, with the resources we have right now, it's hard to offer it to everybody. So we are we're trying to limit it to people who absolutely need it. Um, but we, I, I think in the future, more and more opportunities and even more of the payers are going to pay for uh, the pharmacist to offer some services at home. Yes, and sometimes um, I would... I've had patients that would answer my questions the way they think I want to hear them not necessarily the truth. And until they're honest with me, can I really know the, the opportunities to improve their health care? Um, I had- Nope. No. Oh, God. No, I had a patient that was taking two hypertensive medications and took two of the generics instead of taking a generic and, a, and the name brand, which was the ideal treatment plan because he was just thinking, well, I need two um, hypertensive medications, so I'll just take the cheaper one. But he didn't want to tell me that he didn't want, he couldn't afford the name brand. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and a lot of times you'll find, um, you, you'll talk when you're at home, you'll talk to the uh, spouse or to the children and they'll tell you certain things. They'll be like, yeah, my dad does not do this or my dad doesn't take his medicine. And then You'll get, you'll get to know. And of course, the, the patient smiles and they tell you, yes, he's right. Uh, nobody wants to be a bad patient. Everybody wants to be a good patient who listens and does everything the way they're supposed to. Exactly. We have another question in chat and it says, with so many people facing uh, many challenges, how do you help them to advocate for their own health? Uh, find out, find out what's what what's the challenge, what the challenge is, and look at your resources. Um, what can you offer them? For some people, uh, the challenge is remembering to take their medication because they are on fifteen different meds. For them, maybe it's a bubble packing. Uh, for some people, it's the cost of the medication. Uh, and then, f if somebody, for example, has a high copay on Genuvia or uh, uh, or maybe as uninsured and the doctor prescribes them Genuvia and they can't afford it, what can you do to call the prescriber and change it to something else that's less expensive? Um, sometimes it's a manufactured coupon. Maybe you just contact the manufacturer and see if you can help them with the manufactured coupon. Um, sometimes Sometimes it's, for example, when it comes to vaccines, the hesitancy is, is because they had wrong information that they got from the internet. For, that, for them, it's just gonna be an education and trying and using your motivational uh, interviewing skills uh, in order to convince them to do the right thing. So it's different people are different and, and you just have to know what resources you have in order to take care of them. I mean, today I had a patient just like a couple hours ago, a patient who needed uh, her Synthroid um, and she's uninsured. And Synthroid is, is, not, is not that expensive, but she just could not even afford, she couldn't pay the $20 for, because she's on two different strings. So they called me from the pharmacy and they're like, oh, there's this patient, what can we do to help? I'm like, let's give it to her for free. It's, 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 it's Synthroid, it's not gonna cost, it's not gonna cost a lot of money and, uh, 
this this is a patient who otherwise would have skipped her thyroid medication uh, because she's uninsured. She she was an un, undocumented immigrant, so she did not have insurance at all. So uh, when you have these resources, it's it's nice to be able to have that power to uh, serve people and help people. And you've empowered your staff to actually know Absolutely. that they use you as bouncing off ideas like I've used all my other resources and I'm at this point, I'm not quite sure what to do next. Yeah. And sometimes we assume that everybody can afford the $20 medication. But that's not true. For some people, they can't. Right. And being uncomfortable with, you know, okay, they were undocumented, you know, um, the re one of the reasons why they probably don't have insurance and, you know, just being able to, to realize that that's an obstacle we can, we can deal with. Right. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Well, we are almost at time. Is there any other questions from the group? I'm just looking at the chat real quick. I actually um, would just advocate, you know, for listening to the patients and taking the time to learn more about Absolutely. Absolutely. As, a, as a person, you learn what's really important to them. Yeah. Um, and um, if anybody has any questions for me after the presentation, they can always send me a message through LinkedIn. And I check I check LinkedIn frequently. So if they have a, a question, private question, they can just send it to me. We have one question. Interested in your input on um, what makes a good partnership with an academic institution? Um, uh, uh, the best relationship is a win-win relationship. Find out what you can offer that institution um, and then how you can serve them and take care of their needs. And in return, they're going to they're gonna help you. For example, we were approached a couple of months ago by a professor at the, Medi at the uh, University of Wisconsin, and they have a clinical study. They want to target uh, patients with diabetes in the Black community to, um, to see how we can improve their A1C. <coughs> Excuse me. So... Uh, for them, it was a win. We said, yes, we'll take care of you. We'll help you. We'll identify those patients. We'll send the letters. We'll, we'll train our pharmacists to identify those patients for you. So it was a win for the institution and a win for the pharmacy. Absolutely. Um, just so everyone's aware in chat, um, there is some um, links to Hashem's Pharmacy. Um, so just in case you would like to go ahead and, and um, get that information one thing that I, I should have started out, um, but why do you call your pharmacies Hyatt Pharmacies? Back in 2011, uh, my wife, Bushra, and I, we were just discussing what should we name the pharmacy. And we wanted something that has a beautiful meaning in our native language and also easy to pronounce in English. So we thought of the name Hyatt, which means life, because our goal is to really give people a good, healthy life. Um, so we life in Arabic is Hyatt. So uh, we and it's it's easy to pronounce in English. Um, so we 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 named it Hyatt, and we stuck to that name uh, for the last 13, 14 years. Uh, it's funny we actually got. Um, a couple of years ago, we got a voicemail. Um, some a, a customer left a voicemail uh, for us, and she said, "I love your pharmacist. I love your uh, technicians. You guys do such a great job. And when I travel, I even go to your hotels." I'm like, "No, that's not my hotel. <laughs> that's the other Hyatt. <laughs> I I wish I owned the hotel." <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, no, but I, I really feel as if you've really m made um, the community having a healthier life. Um, and Hyatt is just perfect. Um, you and your wife picked out a perfect name that really contributes to everything that you do. It, it's just amazing. I mean, um, one, in, during the uh, pandemic, we vaccinated over 100,000 patients at our pharmacy. That's a lot of patients, and those for some, I I really believe that by doing that, some of those those patients are alive today, because 
God offered them this opportunity to get the vaccine with us. So, uh, so it truly is. We're give, we're trying to give people a, a long life. Yeah, and one thing that you you brought up um, your COVID vaccines, and I remember many times for people to get their COVID vaccines, they had to sign up on the internet, and you <laughs> received a letter from an older lady thanking you for letting her come in and as a walk-in to get her COVID vaccine because she didn't have the internet. And, and how elderly people know how to use different apps. Initially, um, they wanted to limit the number of people initially because we, the supply was very limited of the vaccine. So some of the uh, companies decided, oh, you have to download our app and make an appointment. Uh, we couldn't even take appointments over the phone. Everything has to be done through the app. And knowing the communities that we serve, that was really a challenge. So we've decided to uh, offer it by walk-ins. Yes, people had to wait in line, but they, it was expected. People, people were very, they, they were happy to get the vaccine at the end of the day, and they were willing to wait in line. We've had pe we had people who had to wait for like an hour and a half, two hours to get the vaccine but they were okay because it, it, an appointment was not needed. They can just walk in, whether it's the 70 year old lady or, or even the 50 year old uh, gentleman who doesn't speak English. Uh, it was, it, it, they could just come in and we'll take care of them. And that, that made, made a huge difference. Um, the simpler you, I mean, healthcare, a lot of time, one of the barriers to healthcare is technology. And sometimes we don't think of it. And if you if you remove that barrier, then patients can come and and are able to come and get taken care of. That's that's so so true. Um, I know we've been able to touch base on a lot of different things. Is there anything that you um, would like to mention that we weren't able to discuss yet? We have a couple more minutes left. Uh, if there's any pharmacy student in this call. Uh, the opportunities you will have in your lifetime are like probably 10 times more than the opportunities we had uh, in our generation. So uh, get ready, um, be, be open-minded, uh, take risks. It's okay to take risks. And, and sometimes it's okay. I mean, working for another company is good, but if you can establish your own Pharmacy, do it. There are there are a lot of opportunities. There are a lot of rural areas in Wisconsin that are, are pharmacy deserts. So if any of you are interested, there are a lot of opportunities. I, I would recommend that you do it. You would be an excellent mentor. <laughs> I I love it. I actually, I speak um, at the ownership workshop where um, future pharmacy owners go to NCPA and they learn about uh, pharmacy ownership. And, and actually, that's one of my uh, most enjoyable uh, presentation. Because, and people usually come to me. I've had people who flew in from other states just to come and spend a day in our pharmacy. And I, give the, I usually give them the warning. Yes, we do a lot of things uh, in a good way, but you'll find a lot of flaws. You'll, found, you'll find a lot of efficiency. We're not perfect. Uh, but just come and, and maybe you'll learn a few things to do when you open your pharmacy and a couple of things not to do when you open your own pharmacy. Always remember it's a pilot. We learn from all of our mistakes. It, it is. And I, I'm, I'm really proud to say that um, I, I'm, I'm, I admit that sometimes we have flaws and we're just learning and we're improving. Um, and, and, and we're not afraid to say that we're not perfect. Well, thank you so much. Um, so starting out with, here comes the sun. You are definitely the sun. You are the light for many people's lives, our highest. Thank you. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Kara. I appreciate it. Um, on behalf of all of the guests today, I want to say thank you for coming today and sharing your expertise, your passion for our community. I really appreciate it. I, I really enjoyed this. And um, it's my way of paying it forward. Um, I'm 50 years old, and I want to make sure that I leave a legacy of helping the others. Uh, so if, and if, if I can be an inspiration or a help for any of uh, the people listening, 
please reach out to me and I'll be more than happy to uh, help you. And, it, and if you want to come and visit us in the pharmacy, just send me a message on LinkedIn and we'll, we'll arrange for that. Well, thank you so much. Um, so um, for everyone, thanks for joining today. We do have our next um, uh, in community engagement opportunity on April 24th. Make sure that you take the time and learn more about our opportunities here within Milwaukee and elsewhere that we can learn from. And um, we can pilot different areas and learn from them. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much, everybody.